My guest today is Mike Amundsen. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great. It's good to see you, David. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I, I overslept this morning. I must have had a better <laughs> holiday than I remember. Well, you deserve it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, hey, I was. Uh, it was good to see you when you came to Chicago last month. Yeah. And I yeah. understand you gave a, a talk on something that you invented. Yes, that's that's a good way to put it. Yes, it's on a, it's on a. Uh, a tool, a command line tool that I've created in order to help me do my work on uh, web APIs. What's it called? It's called Hyper CLI. So okay. it's uh, the Hyper. So I do a lot of things with Hypermedia and connected forums and links and stuff like that. And yeah, you're kind of to, the uh, famous for Hypermedia. You've written books yeah, famous, all the time. infamous, uh, <laughs> and whatever whatever the phrase you'd use. And this is a tool that helps me explore APIs uh, in a very kind of like predictable sort of way. So there, I created this tool, which is kind of like curl, but it has a session memory. So it's a little bit more like, say, uh, command line Node.js or Python or Ruby or something like that. And then I had to kind of create a bit of an interactive language for using it. So um, I did this a couple of years ago, and I've kept it to myself for quite a while. And finally, just this, this year, I've been starting to talk about it. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So it's uh, it, curl is relatively simple tool. I typically use it just one line at a time. Yep. It's used for calling HTTP requests. Could be an yep. API. It could could even be a web page, I guess. Um, yep. And uh, I can tell it, you know, whether it's a what the verb is, is it a get or is it a post? Uh, what's the URL? Uh, I can add headers. It can get really really long command. I can add. Mm -hmm. uh, um, just all sorts of things to it. Is it? Um, is there any significant difference between curl yeah. and your tool? Yeah. So I, I, I've used curl a lot, and in my my previous book on it, web API programming, design and build great web APIs, I use curl constantly, and I introduce right. it as one of the very first tools. I still use that quite a bit, but there are times when I want to do a little bit more, or I want to write a bit of a script rather than just do it all as one liners. And the syntax for curl gets pretty, as you mentioned, gets pretty gnarly. I found myself writing bash scripts to use curl, which I oh. thought, you know, this tells me something. Right. Um, so I created this hyper CLI as a way to do all the things that curl does. You can do all the stuff you just mentioned, control headers and even authorization and all these other kinds of features. But I wanted to do a little bit more and make it a little bit easier to interact with web APIs. So that's why I really invented the, the Hyper CLI, is to kind of do a little bit more than curl. It has a kind of a, a, a language of its own, sort of a domain-specific language of APIs. OK, so you had to invent a language to use yeah. the tool that you invented. Tell me about the language. Yeah, so it's sort of a, it's sort of a rabbit hole situation. So once you, once you build the tool, now you kind of got yourself set up to like, how do I interact with the tool? So the, the language, I call it hyperlang, just because uh, you know, I don't have a great naming uh, system. Works for me. By the way, there are lots of other very cool tools that are called hyper, so there's a lot of confusion. This, this might have to change at some time in the future. But what I did is I created a language that um, is inspired a lot by, you, you might find this humorous, inspired a lot by COBOL. And, it, and, the, and the predecessor of COBOL uh, called Flowmatic. So these languages early on in the computer age, COBOL is more than 70 years old, uh, were designed to make it a little bit more conversational to speak uh, computer language. In other words, oh. the, it's, COBOL is designed to be verbose. Right. So there's been a trend over the last several decades to make uh, computer languages more and more terse and more and more general. So C and Python and Ruby and Node and all that stuff. They're pretty generalized languages. So I created one that's more verbose and very specific to working with APIs. So it says things like call and then with a URL, uh, with this data, uh, uh, and this method. So you actually have phrases like with and so on and so forth. And even to the point where it simply says um, call using this form, using the data in memory, and solves a problem. So you actually have less things to type than you would with curl. Oh, interesting. So uh, the idea is that it's, and it's also more readable, right? Because it looks more like English. Yes, yes, okay. yes. It does. It almost, they almost look like sentences that you'd put together. And then since you can write a script, 
you can actually have a sort of a conversation. That was sort of the idea. Have a conversation with a remote server. Okay, so now, help me understand, is it the, the language is used to call HyperCLI, or is HyperCLI written in the DSL? So, well, okay, so HyperCLI is actually written in Node.js. It's a command line tool oh. in, in, in Node.js. So, and the source code's available, and you can even write you know, plugins and other stuff to it. So it's a, it's a pretty open, uh, simplistic kind of uh, language parser. But the HyperLang itself gets, is separate, so that's designed to simply be an interactive language for websites. So you really, right now, you need the two together because there are no other tools that use the hyperlang that I created. Um, so it, they're two different creations, but they work together. Uh, well, tell me, give me a scenario when you'll use these tools. Okay, a great example is I want to actually interact with a, a website to see if it supports a certain kind of functionality. So maybe I want to manage it, you know, manage user accounts or something like that. So I can actually say, call this first URL, and maybe somebody gave me a URL, call this first URL um, and return the response and tell me all the links and all the forms that are in that response. So I can actually say, you know, make a request, I get a 200 okay, I get the body, but then I have other statements like show links, show forms. And it'll give you the, the names of the links in the form. So there might be a, a, a link named a list or filter. So I can say, oh, well, tell me about the you know, um, show filter form or link, and it'll tell me all the arguments you can pass and so on and so forth. So it's really a way for me to kind of inspect the API in real time and then write a script that says, okay, with the uh, form called link, pass the following data and give me the response. So now I'm actually kind of conversing with that uh, API and I haven't actually even read any documentation. Oh, okay, are, now are you making any assumptions about the structure of the responses coming back, like that it's JSON in the body or XML in the body, for example? Yes, so the, 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 the CLI is smart enough to, to tell me exactly what the, uh, what the type was Okay. So there are actually media types headers, right? So it'll say it's application JSON or it's application XML or HTML or collection JSON or Uber or Mason or whatever the, the format is. And then uh, it is also smart enough to know for formats like HTML or collection JSON or HAL, how that structure, how the, those messages are typically structured. So when I say, show me the links, it knows, oh, okay, well this is HTML, so I know how to find all the links in an HTML document and then shows me those. Or if it says, this is HAL, then I know how to find the links in HAL and the templates in HAL, so it shows me those. And that's, that's a sort of a language plugin that I can, I can create. So you can assume uh, so some basics like application or XML, or you can use one of these language plugins and the, the CLI is smart enough to figure that out. I see. And if I want to use the tool, do I, do I uh, download something? Do I install something? What's step one? Well, actually, yeah, at that, that, that the npmjs site, there's a, you know, at mem and whack hyper. You can look up uh, uh, my name, my uh, GitHub name, at mem and M-A-M-U-N-D, and it's listed there, and you can download it from there. Uh, and then it, it'll install it automatically. So it uses all the NPM tools to do the installation and stuff like that. Right now, the only version that, that's available is the Node.js command line version okay. of it. But uh, I have a plan to do a library, so if I do a generalized library in Node, then it would be easier to port that generalized library to C-sharp or some other languages in the future. Okay, so it has a dependency. You have to have a Node installed first, and then you use Node yeah. NPM yep. to install this library. Okay. Yep. Uh, yep. Tell me a little bit about the process of developing this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so like I said, I was, I was motivated because I was doing a lot of interactions with web APIs, so I wanted to kind of simplify my interactions. And then I said, well, I could script some of this with curl, but there are other things I need to remember. For instance, one of the things I like to do is read all the information from one page and then use that data on another page. In other words, collect up all of this, this uh, data, these responses from this website, and then go through that stack of responses and write to some other site. So what I did is I had to write a memory so that every request, every 200 OK you get, gets put on a stack in memory. Mm -hmm. So there's more and more of them. If I ask for 10 requests, I get 10 copies, 10 responses in my memory that I can then address later. 
So I had to figure out how to memorize or remember uh, these various responses, which is what a browser does with its cache, for example. Mm -hmm. And then I had to figure out how to start to manipulate them. So um, I literally wrote a very simple loop, um, uh, a sort of a, a wild wind loop, and you just add a line to the system. It expense, ex inspects every token on the line, decides, oh, you're asking it to go out to this website. It runs a HTTP request. It comes back. It places it in memory. You're asking me to show you the response. You're asking me to show you the links. So I just literally start writing commands. So it's basically a bunch of you know, uh, use cases. Um, so I just started building it up from there. And then I realized. Uh, it's getting kind of big, and I started breaking it up into plugins or smaller parts of it. So it's, it's actually a very incremental process that it took about a year, I think, to build up what I have today. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it's, it's online, and I had uh, it's, there's a GitHub repo here. Yep. That, yep. Uh, are you, uh, it's, so it's open source. What, yep. what's, what's the licensing around it? Um, it's, I think it's the MIT license. It's the default license in GitHub, or it's a variation on the MIT, so you can use it in any way you wish. I don't make any claims. There have been a couple of contributions already. I think I've gotten at least one or two plugins from somebody else. Oh, wow. Uh, How's that it. going? So I, I think it's going pretty good. Um, the challenge is the, the, a project like this needs some good attention. And it's a little challenging for me to give it the proper attention it needs to keep it uh -huh. uh, updated and clean and stuff like that. So any time I get some interest, uh, it's always kind of spurs me on to spend a little more time on it. it it's, not a, it's not a high traffic uh, repo, but there are several downloads every single day, and people uh, send me questions and comments about it, and then hopefully I get to incorporate those, those uh, ideas into the next version. Okay, so, so they're, rather than a contributing code, they're contributing ideas tends to be the, it's, the it's community both. response. Oh, okay. It's both. Sometimes there are just issues like something doesn't work as expected, whether it's a bug or it was a design you know, a miscalculation. And sometimes somebody says, look, I, I have a, a domain language that I'd like to make as a plugin. So they actually contribute the plugin, and then the plugin becomes part of the download package. Oh, cool. So uh, that, that's hap both of those cases happen every once in a while. All right. Well, maybe we can get more traffic uh, after my literally tens of viewers watch this show. <laughs> No, you have thousands of viewers, and that's, the, that's one of the reasons I love talking to you. Um, yes. This is, uh, uh, what, what do people want to learn about it? What's, what's the best place to go? Um, there's actually a, uh, a web page associated with it. Uh, well, actually, I would start with, there's an article on my Substack. It's called Programming the Web with Hyperlang and HyperCLI. And that's a good starting point. That gives you kind of a good taste of what it is. And I gave a talk at um, Go to Chicago, that's when you and I were, were uh, meeting up. Uh, and I think there's a link to that talk in, the, in that web page. And then there's a set of slides, so you can start there. There's also uh, a web page that's specifically for uh, the Hyper tool. So um, it's like one of those GitHub IO kind of pages. webapicookbook.githubio slash hyper. Yep. And that tells you about the NPM project, tells you a little bit, it, it copies the README, which is pretty extensive. It, the README is kind of a short uh, little sort of tutorial. And then there, I actually, there's a, there's a Twitter account. I haven't updated the Twitter account in a while, but every once in a while, if I write something, you can, you can follow the tweets. And then there's a kind of set of blog articles or quick tips that just show how you can do different things with the language. So that's a great place to start. And then, I just encourage people to get creative. Um, and I learn already, I've learned people doing things with it that I hadn't intended or I hadn't even imagined mm. you could do. Oh, and cool. that's always, to me, that's always very exciting because that means it sparks somebody in some way. Well, what's the Twitter account? I'm, I'm checking it. Hopefully I'm not throttled this morning. There's been issues with Twitter. <laughs> so that's guess right, don't spend all your tweets. Somebody didn't pay their bill or something was the rumor. I, I guess that's the case. <laughs> what's, okay. the, what's, the tw what's the Twitter account? Um, the Twitter account is actually, I think it's just uh, hyper underscore CLI. Hyper underscore CLI. And right now it says nothing to see here, which is a little bizarre. I think I'm, 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 already, I'm already tapped out for the day. I don't know what's going on. Uh, maybe. There were some issues this week. Yep. Yep. All right. Hyper uh, underscore all right. CLI. I'll check it out and I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. I didn't see it either. Uh, yeah. is, is there anything else we should cover that uh, about this tool? It sounds, I, I, what I really like about it is the simplicity of it. You know, you just yes. NPM install, 
It's a command line tool and you just start using it. Yeah, you just start using it. And I think the real value comes when people start getting interested enough to start expanding it to write their own domain language. You can write your own plugin so you can converse with APIs of all sorts of types. I focused on ones with links and forms, but you could do uh, P PSD2, you could do uh, insurance things with Accord, you can do health things with HL7. You just need to write the language and you can write it step by step. You don't have to start. It's not a big leap to get started. Okay, I'm actually not familiar with a lot of the things you just said there, but these are uh, these are schemas that APIs, these are like schema standards that are returned by yeah. APIs in a specific industry. Is that the idea? Yeah. So PSD2 is for banking. There's also buy-in for banking. That's another schema and domain language. HL7 is for health. Accord is for insurance. So even, even, even inside uh, individual organizations, they may have their own sort of domain-specific way of talking about objects ah, and actions. And, and you can write that into this as a plugin. So pretty soon, you're really writing a domain-specific conversation. Give me my health records from Dr. So-and-so, and it should be uh -huh. able to figure out what you want to do. And that's sort of really the idea behind this, to make it easy to start thinking in terms of general conversation rather than always put and post and delete and things like that. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, where are you speaking next, Mike? I have, oh, um, I have no idea. I just did a thing with <laughs> Interface, API Days Interface, just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm not sure where my next event is going to be. I'm, I'm really focused right now on, on writing, so I'm working on an update for my API design book okay. and just uh, finished a couple other projects as well. So we'll see. I'll be around. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. You stay safe. You too. Good to talk with you, David. Bye-bye. <laughs>